This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Chapter Seven: The Mother's Struggle. It is impossible to conceive of a human creature more wholly desolate and forlorn than Eliza when she turned her footsteps from Uncle Tom's Cabin. Her husband's suffering and dangers, and the danger of her child, all blended in her mind, with a confused and stunning sense of the risk she was running in leaving the only home she had ever known, and cutting loose from the protection of a friend whom she loved and revered. Then there was the parting from every familiar object, the place where she had grown up, the trees under which she had played, the groves where she had walked many an evening in happier days by the side of her young husband. Everything, as it lay in the clear, frosty starlight, seemed to speak reproachfully to her, and ask her whither could she go from a home like that. But stronger than all was maternal love, wrought into a paroxysm of frenzy by the near approach of a fearful danger. Her boy was old enough to have walked by her side, and in an indifferent case she would only have led him by the hand. But now the bare thought of putting him out of her arms made her shudder, and she strained him to her bosom with a convulsive grasp as she went rapidly forward. The frosty ground creaked beneath her feet, and she trembled at the sound. Every quaking leaf and fluttering shadow sent the blood backward to her heart and quickened her footsteps. She wondered within herself at the strength that seemed to be come upon her, for she felt the weight of her boy as if it had been a feather and every flutter of fear seemed to increase the supernatural power that bore her on, while from her pale lips burst forth, in frequent ejaculations, the prayer to a friend above, "'Lord, help! Lord, save me!' If it were your Harry, mother, or your Willie, that were going to be torn from you by a brutal traitor to-morrow morning, if you had seen the man and heard that the papers were signed and delivered, and you had only from twelve o'clock till morning to make good your escape, how fast could you walk? How many miles could you make in those few brief hours, with the darling at your bosom, the little sleepy head on your shoulder, the small soft arms trustingly holding on to your neck? For the child slept. At first the novelty and alarm kept him waking, but his mother so hurriedly repressed every breath or sound, and so assured him that if he were only still, she would certainly save him, that he clung quietly round her neck, only asking, as he found himself sinking to sleep, "'Mother, I don't need to keep awake, do I?' "'No, my darling, sleep if you want to. But, mother, if I do get asleep, you won't let him get me.' "'No, so may God help me,' said his mother, with a paler cheek and a brighter light in her large dark eyes. "'You're sure, ain't you, mother?' "'Yes, sure,' said the mother, in a voice that startled herself, for it seemed to her to come from a spirit within that was no part of her. And the boy dropped his little weary head on her shoulder, and was soon asleep. How the touch of those warm arms, the gentle breathings that came in her neck, seemed to add fire and spirit to her movements! It seemed to her as if strength poured into her in electric streams from every gentle touch and movement of the sleeping, confiding child. Sublime is the dominion of the mind of the body that, for a time, can make flesh and nerve impregnable, and string the sinews like steel, so that the weak become so mighty. The boundaries of the farm, the grove, the woodlot, passed by her dizzily as she walked on, and still she went, leaving one familiar object after another, slacking not, pausing not, till reddening daylight found her many a long mile from all traces of any familiar objects upon the open highway. She had often been with her mistress to visit some connections in the little village of T, not far from the Ohio River, and knew the road well. To go thither, to escape across the Ohio River, were the first hurried outlines of her plan of escape. Beyond that she could only hope in God. When horses and vehicles began to move along the highway, with that alert perception peculiar to a state of excitement, and which seems to be a sort of inspiration, she became aware that her headlong pace and distracted air might bring on her remark and suspicion. 
She therefore put the boy on the ground, and, adjusting her dress and bonnet, she walked on at as rapid a pace as she thought consistent with the preservation of appearances. In her little bundle she had provided a store of cakes and apples, which she used as expedients for quickening the speed of the child, rolling the apples some yards before them, when the boy would run with all his might after it. And this ruse, often repeated, carried them over many a half-mile. After a while they came to a thick patch of woodland, through which murmured a clear brook. As the child complained of hunger and thirst, she climbed over the fence with him, and sitting down behind a large rock which concealed them from the road, she gave him a breakfast out of her little package. The boy wondered and grieved that she could not eat, and when, putting his arms round her neck, he tried to wedge some of his cake into her mouth, it seemed to her that the rising in her throat would choke her. "'No, no, Harry, darling. Mother can't eat till you are safe. We must go on, on, till we come to the river.' And she hurried again into the road, and again constrained herself to walk regularly and composedly forward. She was many miles past any neighborhood where she was personally known. If she should chance to meet any who knew her, she reflected that the well-known kindness of the family would be of itself a blind to suspicion as making it an unlikely supposition that she could be a fugitive. As she was also so white as not to be known as of colored lineage without a critical survey, and her child was white also, it was much easier for her to pass on unsuspected. On this presumption she stopped at noon at a neat farmhouse to rest herself and buy some dinner for her child and self. For as the danger decreased with the distance, the supernatural tension of the nervous system lessened, and she found herself both weary and hungry. The good woman, kindly and gossiping, seemed rather pleased than otherwise with having somebody come in to talk with, and accepted, without examination, Eliza's statement that she was going on a little piece to spend a week with her friends, all which she hoped in her heart might prove strictly true. An hour before sunset she entered the village of Tea by the Ohio River, weary and footsore, but still strong in heart. Her first glance was at the river, which lay, like Jordan, between her and the Canaan of Liberty on the other side. It was now early spring, and the river was swollen and turbulent. Great cakes of floating ice were swinging heavily to and fro in the turbid waters. Owing to the peculiar form of the shore on the Kentucky side, the land bending far out into the water, the ice had been lodged and detained in great quantities, and the narrow channel which swept round the bend was full of ice, piled one cake over another, thus forming a temporary barrier to the descending ice, which lodged and formed a great undulating raft, filling up the whole river and extending almost to the Kentucky shore. Eliza stood for a moment, contemplating this unfavorable aspect of things, which she saw at once must prevent the usual ferry-boat from running and then turned into a small public-house on the bank to make a few inquiries. The hostess, who was busy in various fizzing and stewing operations over the fire, preparatory to an evening meal, stopped, with a fork in her hand, as Eliza's sweet and plaintive voice arrested her. "'What is it?' she said. "'Isn't there any ferry or boat that takes people over to B now?' she said. "'No, indeed,' said the woman. "'The boats have stopped running.' Eliza's look of dismay and disappointment struck the woman, and she said inquiringly, "'Maybe you're wanting to get over? Anybody sick? You seem mighty anxious.' "'I've got a child that's very dangerous,' said Eliza. "'I never heard of it till last night, and I've walked quite a piece to-day, in hopes to get to the ferry.' "'Well, now, that's unlucky,' said the woman, whose motherly sympathies were much aroused. "'I'm really concerned for you.' "'Solomon!' she called from the window towards a small back building. A man in leather apron and very dirty hands appeared at the door. "'I say, Sol!' said the woman. "'Is that our man going to tote them barrels over to-night?' "'He said he should try, if twas any way prudent,' said the man. "'There's a man apiece down here that's going over with some truck this evening, if he dares to. He'll be in here to supper to-night, so you'd better sit down and wait. That's a sweet little fellow.' added the woman, offering him a cake. But the child, wholly exhausted, cried with weariness. "'Poor fellow! He isn't used to walking, and I've hurried him on so,' said Eliza. "'Well, take him into this room,' said the woman, opening into a small bedroom, 
where stood a comfortable bed. Eliza laid the weary boy upon it, and laid his hands in hers till he was fast asleep. For her there was no rest. As a fire in her bones the thought of the pursuer urged her on, and she gazed with longing eyes on the sullen, surging waters that lay between her and liberty. Here we must take our leave of her for the present, to follow the course of her pursuers. Though Mrs. Shelby had promised that the dinner should be hurried on table, yet it was soon seen, as the thing has often been seen before, that it required more than one to make a bargain. So, although the order was fairly given out in Haley's hearing, and carried to Aunt Chloe by at least half a dozen juvenile messengers, that dignitary only gave certain very gruff snorts and tosses of her head, and went on with every operation in an unusually leisurely and circumstantial manner. For some singular reason an impression seemed to reign among the servants, generally, that Mrs. would not be particularly disobliged by delay, and it was wonderful what a number of counter-accidents occurred constantly to retard the course of things. One luckless white contrived to upset the gravy, and then gravy had to be got up de novo, with due care and formality. Aunt Chloe, watching and stirring with dogged precision, answering shortly to all suggestions of haste, that she warn't a goin' to have a raw gravy on the table to help nobody's catchings. One tumbled down with the water, and had to go to the spring for more, and another precipitated the butter into the path of events, and there was from time to time giggling news brought into the kitchen that Massa Haley was mighty oneasy, and that he couldn't sit in his cheer no ways but was a-talkin' and stalkin' to the winders and through the porch. "'Saves him right,' said Aunt Chloe, indignantly. "'He'll get was nor on easy one of these days, if he don't mend his ways. His master'll be sendin' for him, and then see how he'll look.' "'He'll go to torment, and no mistake,' said little Jake. "'He deserves it,' said Aunt Chloe, grimly. "'He's broke a many, many, many hearts, I tell you all,' she said, stopping, with a fork uplifted in her hands. It's like what Massa George reads in Revelations. Souls are callin' under the altar, and a callin' on the Lord for vengeance on sich, and by and by the Lord he'll hear em, so he will." Aunt Chloe, who was much revered in the kitchen, was listened to with open mouth, and the dinner being now fairly sent in, the whole kitchen was at leisure to gossip with her, and to listen to her remarks. "'Sich will be burnt up forever, and no mistake, won't there?' said Andy. "'I'd be glad to see it, I'll be bound,' said little Jake. Chillin said a voice that made them all start. It was Uncle Tom, who had come in, and stood listening to the conversation at the door. "'Chillin,' he said, "'I'm afeard you don't know what you're saying. Forever is a dreadful word, chillin. It's awful to think on't. You oughtn't wish that hurt to any human critter." "'We wouldn't to anybody but the soul-drivers,' said Andy. "'Nobody can help wishing it to them. They so awfully wicked.' "'Don't nature herself kinder cry out on em? said Aunt Chloe. Don't they tear der suckin' baby right off of his mother's breast, and sell him and der little children as is cryin' and holdin' on by her clothes? Don't they pull em off and sells em? Don't they tear wife and husband apart?" said Aunt Chloe, beginning to cry, when it's just taken the very life on em. And all the while does they feel one bit, don't they drink and smoke and take it uncommon easy? Lord, if the devil don't get them, what's he good for? And Aunt Chloe covered her face with her checkered apron and began to sob in good earnest. "'Pray for them that spitefully use you, the good book says,' says Tom. "'Pray for em said Aunt Chloe. "'Lor, it's tough. I can't pray for em "'It's nature, Chloe, and nature's strong,' said Tom. "'But the Lord's grace is stronger. Besides, you ought to think what an awful state a poor critter's soul's in that'll do them our things. You ought to thank God that you ain't like him, Chloe.' I'm sure I'd rather be sold ten thousand times over than to have all that our poor critters got to answer for." "'So I'd a heap,' said Jake. "'Lor, shouldn't we cotch it, Andy?' Andy shrugged his shoulders and gave an acquiescent whistle. "'I'm glad Master didn't go off this morning as he looked to,' said Tom. "'That ar hurt me more than sellin' it did. Maybe it might have been natural for him, but it would have come desperate hard on me, as has known him for my baby. But I've seen Master, and I begin to feel sort of reconciled to the Lord's will now. Master couldn't help hisself. He did right, but I'm afeard things will be kind of going to rack when I'm gone. Master can't be spected to be prying round everywhere as I've done, and keeping up all at the ends. 
The boys all means well, but they's powerful careless. That art troubles me." The bell here rang, and Tom was summoned to the parlor. "'Tom,' said his master kindly, "'I want you to notice that I give this gentleman bonds to forfeit a thousand dollars if you are not on the spot when he wants you. He's going to-day to look after his other business, and you can have the day to yourself. Go anywhere you like, boy.' "'Thank you, massa,' said Tom. "'And mind yourself,' said the trader, "'and don't come it over your master with any of your nigger tricks, for I'll take every cent out of him if you ain't thar. If he'd hear to me, he wouldn't trust any on you, slippery as eels.' "'Massa,' said Tom, and he stood very straight, "'I was just six years old when old missus put you into my arms, and you wasn't a year old. Thar, says she, "'Tom, that's to be your young massa. Take good care of him,' says she. "'And now I just ask you, massa, have I ever broke word to you, or gone contrary to you, especially since I was a Christian?" Mr. Shelby was fairly overcome, and the tears rose to his eyes. "'My good boy,' said he, "'the Lord knows you say but the truth, and if I was able to help it, all the world shouldn't buy you.' "'And sure as I am a Christian woman,' said Mrs. Shelby, "'you shall be redeemed as soon as I can bring together means. Sir,' she said to Haley, "'take good account of who you sell him to, and let me know." "'Lor, yes, for that matter,' said the trader. "'I may bring him up in a year, and not much the worse for wear, and trade him back.' "'I'll trade with you, then, and make it for your advantage,' said Mrs. Shelby. "'Of course,' said the trader. "'All's equal with me. Lives trade him up as down, so I does a good business. All I want is a living, you know, ma'am. That's all any of us wants, I suppose.' Mr. and Mrs. Shelby both felt annoyed and degraded by the familiar impudence of the trader, and yet both saw the absolute necessity of putting a constraint on their feelings. The more hopelessly sordid and insensible he appeared, the greater became Mrs. Shelby's dread of his succeeding in recapturing Eliza and her child, and of course the greater her motive for detaining him by every female artifice. She therefore graciously smiled, assented, chatted familiarly, and did all she could to make time pass imperceptibly. At two o'clock Sam and Andy brought the horses up to the posts, apparently greatly refreshed and invigorated by the scamper of the morning. Sam was there new-oiled from dinner, with an abundance of zealous and ready officiousness. As Haley approached, he was boasting in flourishing style to Andy of the evident and eminent success of the operation, now that he had fairly come to it. "'Your master, I suppose, don't keep no dogs,' said Haley, thoughtfully, as he prepared to mount. "'Heaps of em,' said Sam triumphantly. "'There's Bruno. He's roar. And, besides that, about every nigger of us keeps a pup of some nature or other.' "'Poe,' said Haley, and he said something else, too, with regard to the said dogs, at which Sam muttered, "'I don't see no use cussin' on em no way.' "'But your master don't keep no dogs. I pretty much know he don't, for trackin' out niggers.' Sam knew exactly what he meant, but he kept on a look of earnest and desperate simplicity. "'Our dogs all smells round considerable sharp. I spect they's the kind, though. They, they ain't never had no practice. They's fire dogs, though, at most anything, if you'd get em started. Here, Bruno!' he called, whistling to the lumbering Newfoundland, who came pitching tumultuously towards them. "'You go hang!' said Haley, getting up. "'Come, tumble up now!' Sam tumbled up accordingly, dexterously contriving to tickle Andy as he did so, which occasioned Andy to split out into a laugh, greatly to Haley's indignation, who made a cut at him with his riding-whip. "'I'm astonished at you, Andy,' said Sam, with awful gravity. "'This here is serious business, Andy. You mustn't be a-making game. This here ain't no way to help Massa.' "'I shall take the straight road to the river,' said Haley decidedly, after they had come to the boundaries of the estate. I know the way of all of them. They make tr tracks for the underground." "'Sartin,' said Sam. "'That's the idea. Massa Haley hits the thing right in the middle. Now there's two roads to the river. The dirt road and der pike. Which Massa mean to take?' Andy looked up innocently at Sam, surprised at hearing this new geographical fact, but instantly confirmed what he said by a vehement reiteration. "'Cause,' said Sam, "'I'd rather be glad to imagine that Lizzie take dirt road, being its least traveled." Haley, notwithstanding that he was a very old bird, and naturally inclined to be suspicious of chaff, was rather brought up by this view of the case. "'If you weren't both on your such cussed liars now,' he said contemplatively, as he pondered a moment. The pensive, reflective tone in which this was spoken appeared to amuse Andy prodigiously, 
and he drew a little behind, and shook so as apparently to run a great risk of falling off his horse, while Sam's face was immovably composed into the most doleful gravity. "'Course,' said Sam, "'Massa can do as he'd rather. Go de straight road, if Massa thinks best. It's all one to us. Now, when I study upon it, I think the straight road de best, deridedly.' "'She would naturally go a lonesome way,' said Haley, thinking aloud, and not minding Sam's remark. "'Dare ain't no sayin', said Sam. Gals is peculiar. They never do nothin' you thinks they will. More generally the contrary. Gals is naturally made contrary, and so, if you think they's gone one road, it is sartin you'd better go t'other, and then you'll be sure to find em. Now, my private opinion is, Lizzie took their road, so I think we'd better take the straight one." This profound generic view of the female sex did not seem to dispose Haley particularly to the straight road, and he announced decidedly that he should go the other, and asked Sam when they should come to it. "'A little piece ahead,' said Sam, giving a wink to Andy with the eye which was on Andy's side of the head, and he added gravely, "'But I've studied on the matter, and I'm quite clar we ought not to go that dar away. I never been over it no way. It's despite lonesome, and, and we might lose our way. Whar we'd come to, de Lord only knows.' "'Nevertheless,' said Haley, "'I shall go that way. Now that I think on it, I think I hear em tell that dat our road was all fenced up and down by der creek, and thar, ain't it, Andy?' Andy wasn't certain. He'd only hearn tell about that road, but never been over it. In short, he was strictly noncommittal. Haley, accustomed to strike the balance of probabilities between lies of greater or lesser magnitude, thought that it lay in favor of the dirt road aforesaid. The mention of the thing he thought he perceived was involuntarily on Sam's part at first, and his confused attempts to dissuade him he set down to a desperate lying on second thoughts as being unwilling to implicate Liza. When, therefore, Sam indicated the road, Haley plunged briskly into it, followed by Sam and Andy. Now, the road, in fact, was an old one, that had formerly been a thoroughfare to the river, but abandoned for many years after the laying of the new pike. It was open for about an hour's ride, and after that it was cut across by various farms and fences. Sam knew this fact perfectly well. Indeed, the road had been so long closed up that Andy had never heard of it. He therefore rode along with an air of dutiful submission, only groaning and vociferating occasionally, that "'Twas desperate rough and bad for Jerry's foot." "'Now, I just give your warning," said Haley. "'I know yer. Yer won't get me to turn off this road with all yer fussin', so you shut up." "'Mass will go on his way,' said Sam, with rueful submission, at the same time winking most portentously to Andy, whose delight was now very near the explosive point. Sam was in wonderful spirits, professed to keep a very brisk lookout, at one time exclaiming that he saw a gal's bonnet on the top of some distant eminence, or calling to Andy, "'If that thar wasn't Lizzie down the hollow!' always making these exclamations in some rough or craggy part of the road, where the sudden quickening of speed was a special inconvenience to all parties concerned, and thus keeping Haley in a state of constant commotion. After riding about an hour in this way, the whole party made a precipitate and tumultuous descent into a barnyard belonging to a large farming establishment. Not a soul was in sight, all the hands being employed in the fields. But as the barn stood conspicuously and plainly square across the road, it was evident that their journey in that direction had reached a decided finale. "'Want that are what I tell you, master?' said Sam, with an air of injured innocence. "'How does strange gentlemen speck to know more about a country than the natives born and raised?' "'You rascal!' said Haley. "'You knew all about this!' "'Didn't I tell you I knowed? And you wouldn't believe me. I telled Master twas all shit up and fenced up, and, and I didn't expect we could get through. And he heard me.' It was all too true to be disputed, and the unlucky man had to pocket his wrath with the best grace he was able, and all three faced to the right about, and took up their line of march for the highway. In consequence of all the various delays, it was about three-quarters of an hour after Eliza had laid her child to sleep in the village tavern that the party came riding into the same place. Eliza was standing by the window, looking out in another direction, when Sam's quick eye caught a glimpse of her. Haley and Andy were two yards behind. At this crisis Sam contrived to have his hat blown off, and uttered a loud and characteristic ejaculation, which startled her at once. She drew suddenly back the whole train swept by the window, round to the front door. A thousand lives seemed to be concentrated in that one moment to Eliza. 
Her room opened by a side door to the river. She caught her child, sprang down the steps towards it. The trader caught a full glimpse of her just as she was disappearing down the bank, and throwing himself from his horse, and calling loudly on Sam and Andy, he was after her like a hound after a deer. In that dizzy moment her feet to her scarce seemed to touch the ground, and a moment brought her to the water's edge. Right on behind they came, and nerved with strength such as God gives only to the desperate, with one wild cry and flying leap she vaulted sheer over the turbid current by the shore, on to the raft of ice beyond. It was a desperate leap, impossible to anything but madness and despair, and Haley, Sam, and Andy instinctively cried out and lifted up their hands as she did it. The huge green fragment of ice on which she alighted pitched and creaked as her weight came on it, but she stayed there not a moment. With wild cries and desperate energy she leapt to another and still another cake, stumbling, leaping, slipping, springing upwards again. Her shoes are gone, her stockings cut from her feet, while blood marked every step. But she saw nothing, felt nothing, till dimly, as in a dream, she saw the Ohio side, and a man helping her up the bank. "'You're a brave gal now, whoever you are,' said the man with an oath. Eliza recognized the voice and face for a man who owned a farm not far from her old home. "'Oh, Mr. Symes, save me! Do save me! Do hide me!' said Eliza. "'Why, what's this?' said the man. "'Why, if tain't Shelby's gal!' "'My child, this boy, he'd sold him. There is his master," said she, pointing to the Kentucky shore. "'Oh, Mr. Symes, you've got a little boy.' "'So I have,' said the man, as he roughly but kindly drew her up the steep bank. "'Besides, you're a right brave gal. I like grit, wherever I see it.' When they had gained the top of the bank, the man paused. "'I'd be glad to do something for you,' said he. "'But then there's nowhere I could take you. The best I can do is to tell you to go thar,' said he, pointing to a large white house which stood by itself, off the main street of the village. "'Go thar. They're kind folks. There's no kind of danger, but they'll help you. They're up to all of that sort of thing." "'The Lord bless you,' said Eliza earnestly. "'No occasion, no occasion in the world,' said the man. "'What I've done's of no account.' "'Oh, surely, sir, you won't tell any one?' "'Go to thunder, gal. What do you take a feller for?' "'In course not,' said the man. "'Come now, go along like a likely sensible gal as you are. You've earned your liberty, and you shall have it for all of me.' The woman folded her child to her bosom and walked firmly and swiftly away. The man stood and looked after her. "'Shelby now maybe won't think this yard the most neighborly thing in the world, but what's a feller to do? If he catches one of my gals in the same fix, he's welcome to pay back. Somehow I never could see no kind of critter as striving and panting and trying to clear themselves with the dogs after em and go agin em. Besides, I don't see no kind of occasion for me to be hunter and catcher for other folks and either. So spoke this poor, heathenish Kentuckian, who had not been instructed in his constitutional relations, and consequently was betrayed into acting in a sort of Christianized manner which, if he had been better situated and more enlightened, he would not have been left to do. Haley had stood a perfectly amazed spectator of the scene, till Eliza had disappeared up the bank, when he turned a blank, inquiring look on Sam and Andy. "'That ar was a tolerable fair stroke of business,' said Sam. "'The gal's got seven devils in her, I believe,' said Haley. "'How like a wildcat she jumped!' "'Wild now,' said Sam, scratching his head. "'I hope Master excuse us trying that our road. Don't think I feel spry enough for dat ar no way.' And Sam gave a hoarse chuckle. "'You laugh,' said the trader, with a growl. "'Lord bless you, Master, I couldn't help it now,' said Sam, giving way to the long, pent-up delight of his soul. "'She looks so curious, a-leapin' and springin', ice up-crackin', only to hear her plump, her curb-chunk, her splash-spring. Lord, how she goes it!' And Sam and Andy laughed till the tears rolled down their cheeks. "'I'll make your laugh to the side of your mouth,' said the trader, laying about their heads with his riding whip. Both ducked and ran, shouting up the bank, and were on their horses before he was up. "'Good evening, Massa,' said Sam, with much gravity. "'I very much spect Mrs. be anxious about Jerry. Massa Haley won't want us no longer. Mrs. wouldn't hear of our riding the critters over Lizzie's bridge to-night.' And with a facetious poke into Andy's ribs, he started off, followed by the latter, at full speed, their shouts of laughter coming faintly on the wind. End of chapter 7